do turn, if you will, back to Job chapter 6 and the passage that we read in the first 13 verses of that chapter. If you were here a couple of weeks ago, you may uh, remember that uh, we looked at this, these verses as we considered the unchangeable nature of Christ in his purpose towards his people, in his attentiveness to them and his keeping of them. And this evening I'd like us to turn our attention and our thoughts to Job and particularly to his prayer as it's recorded for us in verses 8 to 10 where we read, Oh, that I might have my request that God would grant me the thing that I long for, that it would please God to crush me, that he would loose his hand and cut me off. Then I would still have comfort, though in anguish I would exult, for he will not spare, for I have not concealed the words of the Holy One. We touched on his prayer last time, but I'd like to consider it further this evening in the light of what we read in the letter of James uh, in his fifth chapter of that letter and the latter part of verse 16 where we're told the effective fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. And I believe that the prayer of Job was the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man. And that it did indeed avail much as it was uttered and cried to the Lord his God. And the first thing we note is that effective and fervent prayers are made by the righteous. And this morning we thought of the foolishness of using our own reasoning. And when we come to texts like this one, we have a clear example of where our own reasoning can lead us. Because when we look at texts like James 5, verse 16. And we examine ourselves in the light of what is said and in the light of the glory and the holiness of God. Who amongst us would dare to describe themselves as righteous? Surely only the most foolhardy or ignorant We know, don't we, that it's written by Paul in Romans that there is none righteous, no, not one. And if that is the conclusion of our reasoning, it will lead us to hopelessness and despair. And although that is the case for each and every one of us, in our nature as we were born into this world it is not the case with all if you read on in James chapter 5 you find that James gives an example of effective fervent prayer and he uses Elijah And he says, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. Elijah by birth was fallen and sinful as you and I are this evening. Yet he prayed earnestly that it would not rain. And it didn't rain on the land, we're told, for three years and six months. Job, likewise, could be described as a man with a nature like ours. He too was a fallen sinner by birth. And yet, 
We find here in chapter 6 him uttering an effective, fervent prayer. How do we reconcile these apparent contradictions that there is none righteous and yet the righteous can pray effectively and fervently? Well, we find that, don't we, of course, in the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is his work upon the cross and the Spirit's work in the hearts and the lives of his people which changes fundamentally the way they are viewed and we see the extent of that change at the start of the book of Job where three times he's described as blameless and an upright man one who fears God and shuns evil and while it is true that there is no one righteous by their natural birth, that there is no one who can stand before God in their unconverted nature, yet it is possible for God to see sinners as righteous what we sang of a few moments ago, didn't we? It was love divine that sanctified in Christ that church for which he died. In him her holiness was given, her meekness for the joys of heaven. Christ becomes our holiness, ruling our hearts by sovereign grace, and we are sanctified by faith in what our Lord and Saviour Seth, this is the wonder of the Christian conversion, that the unrighteous sinner becomes righteous in the sight of God himself, in and through the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And this evening, if you are found in the family of Christ, then you are among the righteous that this text is referring to. This text is a text that is focused solely upon the church of Christ. But it's a text that is applicable to every member of of it in all generations at all times and in all circumstances this evening if you are a member of the church of Jesus Christ then you have the foundation on which to utter effective fervent prayers that avail much So let's consider these prayers and let's see what distinguishes them from perhaps other prayers. Well, the first thing, of course, is that these prayers are fervent. Now, the word translated as fervent has at its root to work or to labor. The emphasis is on effort. These are prayers of burden. The effective, fervent prayers of the righteous are prayers in which the heart is poured out. They are prayers in which effort is made. Prayers which strain the heart and the soul And if ever there was a prayer uttered by a burdened soul, then surely it was the prayer here of Job. It's a prayer, isn't it, that squeezed out of a heart that is overwhelmed 
by grief and by sorrow and by pain. It's a prayer from the lips of an individual who is all consumed by the subject of his prayer. In Job's case, that was a need for comfort. Do you know what distinguishes a fervent prayer from other prayers? The burden is always there. You know, we thought this morning on remembering. You do not forget when you have a burden. Whether that is a burden of guilt, or a burden of sorrow, or a burden of love. If you have a burden, it weighs upon you. Where there is weight, the cries of the heart are so much more deep and sincere. You want to see fervent prayer at its most extreme and turn to the Lord Jesus Christ as he prays in the garden of Gethsemane as he prostrates himself on the ground before his father in great sorrow of soul bearing the burden of the salvation of his people bearing the weight of their sin and of the penalty of divine justice that will come upon him. Now, not suggesting that fervent prayer will result in our sweat becoming like great drops of blood, as it did in the case of Christ. But fervent prayer carries with it a deep desire. Fervent prayer by its very nature, because of the effort and the burden that is with it, brings anguish and sorrow. You get a sense of the weight and the fervor of Job's prayer, don't you? As he declares that God would grant him the thing that he longs for. This was not one of a number of petitions that Job was bringing before his God. Job was not praying for a number of different items. He didn't have a prayer list. He had one thing on his heart. It dominated his thoughts. It dominated his prayer. It dominated his cries to his God. And no doubt, with each prayer, the sorrow and the grief grew heavier. And the days grew darker. And the focus of his prayers became even more concentrated. You see, the thing with fervent prayer is that it is prayer that is inspired by God himself. In Job's case, it was God who brought the trial that he faced into his life. In Christ's case, it was his Father sending him into the world to redeem his people. In Elijah's case, 
It was his role as prophet, bringing the word of God to the people. It's God who brings the burden. And this evening, if you are engaged in fervent prayer, if you are weighed down by a trial or a sorrow or a burden for others or for yourself, then that burden has been brought upon you. by God for the purpose of bringing you to fervent and effective prayer. You know, we're told in Ephesians chapter 2 that the believer is the workmanship of Christ, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Fervent prayer is one such good work that Christ prepares for his people that they may walk in it. It is therefore a great blessing and a great honour to be engaged in it. It will not feel as though that is the case at the time I'm sure it didn't to Job as he cried out to his God. It may not be acknowledged. It may not be known. It may not be understood by others. It may be downplayed or dismissed. It seems to be the case with Job's friends. But this evening... If you are carrying a heavy burden of prayer, then you've been entrusted with that by Christ. You've been entrusted with a work in which his purposes will be seen and achieved. You're engaged in fervent prayer this evening. You've been given no small honour. Your prayer is often the hidden service in the church, isn't it? Most of it takes place behind closed doors in the secret room or in the silent utterances of the mind and the thoughts and the hearts with only the saints and his heavenly or her heavenly Father present. But fervent prayer is the very lifeblood of the church. And those who are called to it, although we may not know who they are, are perhaps its most valued and most useful members. You know, we need to be aware that those who are laboring in the church most earnestly, that those who are laboring in the church with the greatest sorrow are not always those that are seen, are not always those that are known. Theirs is a labor and a service that is focused at the throne of grace, unseen and unknown maybe to the church and its members. If you're engaged in fervent prayer this evening, if you've been given a burden, then the work can be lonely. It can seem as though it's unappreciated. It can seem as though others are perhaps looking 
and wondering what it is that you are doing in service to your Saviour if you're engaged in fervent prayer this evening. And I can assure you, you are engaged in hard labour. If you're familiar with church history, you will have heard, no doubt, and read of many accounts of revival. And you will have read how those accounts of revival are preceded by times of great prayer. And maybe, as we pray for revival, and we pray for growth, we may wonder what is the difference between the prayers that we utter and the prayers that were uttered in the past. Well, I would suggest the difference is not that we are any less genuine in our desires, and not that we are any less desiring to see Christ glorified and his church grow. But that the burden which Christ placed upon his people in the past was greater and weightier and heavier than the burden that we sense. Perhaps what we should be praying for before we pray for revival is for a greater burden to be given to us. A burden for the lost. A burden for those who do not know Christ. A burden for his glory. Perhaps what we should be praying for is for these burdens to become so heavy and so great that they become all-consuming. And they become the entire focus of our prayer lives. You know, a righteous individual needs to have the work of God in their heart. And for their prayers to be fervent, they need to have a God-given burden. And when that is the case, the promise of James chapter 5 verse 16 is that those prayers will be effective. They cannot be anything else, can they, if they are a response to the work of God in the heart. They will always be effective for the simple reason that they fulfill the sovereign will and purpose of God and that he has determined that he will be glorified and honoured as a result of them. That's why fervent prayer flows from his work in the Christian. Because only he knows what his will is. And only he knows what will bring him glory and honour. We thought last time of the Lord's purpose in bringing the trial upon Job. Job had no idea, no understanding of it. He could see no glory and no honour in his circumstances. But his prayer was effective. And it was fervent. The encouragement tonight is, if Christ has granted you a burden, that has engaged you in fervent prayer, then you can be confident that as sure as God's word stands, your prayer will be effective. That it will be heard and that it will be answered. How long you must engage in it and how many disappointments you must go through 
and face before he reveals his purpose and his answer will vary. Job, it seems, was in fervent prayer, probably throughout his period of trial. How many months it lasted, we don't know. Others are called to fervent prayer, perhaps for years before an answer is seen. Some go to their graves not seeing the answer. But nevertheless, an answer is given and an answer comes because that's the promise of God's word. They are heard. And in accordance with his will, they bring him glory. That's why we can place such confidence in the recorded prayers that we have of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because every one of them was uttered with a burden of love for his people, with a burden of desire for his Father's glory. Every one of them was fervent. Every one of them was uttered with a desire above all else to see his Father's will fulfilled. You're engaged in fervent prayer, Christian, this evening. And you're engaged in a great work. You're engaged in a hard work. But you're engaged in a work that will be effective, will be answered by the God who has given you that burden. And it's a prayer that will accomplish much. You have to go to the end of the book of Job to see just how much Job's fervent prayers accomplished in his life and in the life of his friends. Of the level of comfort that he was granted in answer to his cries. You need to look through church history to see how much more his prayers accomplished in the comfort and the hope that they have brought to countless numbers of saints who in situations of great pain and sorrow and grief have been comforted and granted hope and peace as they followed Job through his trial and as they've heard his prayers and understood them in their own circumstances. We noted a couple of weeks ago how Job's desire for comfort was sought through death. That was the only way he could understand that such comfort could be given. And yet we noted that the answer was far more glorious and far more honouring to his God. And the lesson for us this evening, we're engaged in fervent prayer is not to try and advise or counsel God on the means and the methods and the outcomes of our prayers. 
but rather to wait upon him. And to watch in confidence that he will answer them. And if you want to get a picture of just how much can be accomplished by effective, fervent prayer, and consider again the prayers of Christ. Because his entire church is built upon the answers to his prayers. Every member of it is secured and saved and kept and preserved as a result of them. There is an ever-growing multitude of individuals found in his presence, each and every one of which has been the subject of his fervent prayers. And this evening, if you are a Christian, then you can be confident and you can be encouraged that you are the subject personally of his fervent prayers. You were the subject of them in the past. You are the subject of them this evening. And you will remain the subject of them until he brings you safely into his presence. We're told he ever lives to intercede. Christian, this evening, Christ is fervently interceding on your behalf before his Father's throne. And you can be sure that his prayers will indeed be effective, that they will indeed accomplish all that he has purposed for you, all that he's purposed for you in this life, all that he's purposed for you in your service to him, all that he's purposed for you for eternity to come. If you're engaged in fervent prayer this evening, if you've got that burden and you sense its weight and you sense its sorrow and you feel its anguish, then I want to encourage you that that burden will be lifted. We tend to think of the words in Matthew 11:28 in terms of the burden of guilt that the convicted sinner carries, but they're equally relevant to any burden placed upon his people by Christ, including those engaged in fervent prayer. Come to me, he says, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. This is the end to which your fervent prayer will carry you. Once it's accomplished all that Christ has purposed for it in his will, he will lift that burden from you and give you rest. And having had the burden lifted, the one who has engaged in fervent prayer will be able to delight and to rejoice in the wonder and the mercy and the glory of Christ in answering that prayer and in bringing that burden upon them. There's great joy in answered prayer. There is great joy in having a burden lifted. Job is a great example of it to us, of one who was a righteous man. 
whose prayer was fervent, was laboured, was effort, was a prayer of anguish, a prayer and a burden placed upon him by his God. His was a prayer that was effective. A prayer that was heard and a prayer that was answered and a prayer that was honoured. And his was a prayer that availed much. You're engaged in fervent prayer this evening. Be encouraged by Job. Be encouraged by Christ. And labour on. Amen.